Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Film Daily for Thursday, October 11th, 2018. On today's episode, we're going to talk about the latest film and TV news, and then in the mailbag, we're going to answer some listener emails. This is Slash Film Editor-in-Chief Peter Serretta, and joining me on today's podcast is Slash Film Weekend Editor Brad Oman. Hey, that's me. Senior Writer Ben Pearson. Hey, what's going on? It, it certainly is a Thursday. The news has kind of slowed down a bit, so that will give us a chance to answer some uh, reader mail later on in this podcast. But let's uh, let's start with the news. And uh, yesterday on the podcast, I think it was yesterday, it was either yesterday or the day, the day before, we were talking about Voodoo was teaming up with MGM to basically create uh, new TV shows for a new streaming service from uh, Voodoo. And uh, we kind of went down the list of MGM movies, trying to figure out what they could, what kind of IP they could turn into TV shows, and we we came up kind of short. And now we have learned the first of them. Brad, tell us about it. Yeah, so uh, right out of the gate, the first title that MGM and Voodoo are teaming on is a series adaptation of their 1980s uh, family comedy, Mr. Mom. Uh, which starred Michael Keaton and Terry Garr in a movie where it was set like right in the heart of the the sort of economic uh, downturn that was happening in the early 80s, and Michael Keaton loses his job as uh, at basically like one of the I don't know if he was like an executive or he was he was just one of like the higher level office people at a an automobile manufacturer, and he gets laid off, and so his wife Terry Garr goes out to try and find work. Um, and she ends up getting a job at uh, an advertising company. And so Michael Keaton is left at home to take care of their three kids, uh, two young, like, I would say, like, kindergarten, elementary school age, and then one baby. And so it's uh, it's very much, you know, an, an 80s family-friendly comedy about, you know, how uh, at the time, you know, how odd it was to have, you know, women going back to work and you know, men stuck at home with the kids and oh man can can this dad take care of the, take care of these kids i don't know um but it is the premise easily lends itself to a sitcom style show i'm sure this will be a very a, a family friendly comedy series um i'm not sure how, whether the concept still plays very well today because you know fathers staying at home and taking care of kids is much more commonplace than it was in the 80s at the time this movie was made so I'm not sure how they're going to spice it up or make it feel more modern and contemporary. Um, but, yeah, it's 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 definitely something that you could easily see turned into a, a TV show. Yeah, I, I just don't know how the concept lends, like you said, lends itself to today. Uh, one of my problems with The Incredibles 2 was kind of this, that it was kind of leaning on this kind of concept. And I felt it was kind of not, it didn't feel new or different in any way uh ben do you have any thoughts i know you haven't seen mr mom uh i have not seen this movie and i share the same concerns as you guys and actually the the thing about incredibles 2 not to completely derail this podcast but that's one of the things that i meant to bring up in uh this week's water cooler was one of my issues with that movie was the um the way that uh mr incredible it is like such a dick to his wife in that movie. And then you think that it's going to come back and he's going to have some sort of reckoning with the way that she is, uh, you know, being treated, you know, like the, the premise of that film is that she gets chosen over him to become like a representative for the superheroes. And he is like, so um, transparently dickish of, in his behavior about how that he wasn't chosen, and you feel you, you you think that has to come back at the end of the movie, and it just never does. So it's like what, that was just a dropped plot thread. Uh, one of the one of the other reasons I didn't really care for that film too much. Yeah. Well, anyways, let's move on to our next story, and that is that Dave Batista may be heading to Fantasy Island. Uh, which I guess is being described as Westworld meets Cabin in the Woods. Ben, tell us about it. Yeah, I mean, you say that with uh, with sort of a, a weird tone in your voice, but that combination, Westworld meets Cabin in the Woods, sounds pretty intriguing to me. Um, I, I never watched the TV series Fantasy Island. It was a popular show in the 70s and 1980s. And uh, they're, uh, Sony and Blumhouse are adapting it into a movie. And we know that Michael Pena is going to be playing the character of Mr. Rourke, who is the, the uh, mysterious owner of this island. And Ricardo Montalban played that character in the TV show. 
and uh, now we know that Dave Bautista is in negotiations to star in the movie as well. The premise of the film, uh, the, the film follows a group of contest winners who arrive at an island hotel to live out their dreams, only to find themselves trapped in nightmare scenarios. So Michael Pena's character sort of is lording over this whole thing. And if Dave Bautista ends up making this deal and joins this cast, he's going to play a former guest who is still on the island against his will and who wants to expose Rourke and the island's magical secrets. So, um, yeah, that, I mean, like I said, the, I sort of <laughs> rolled my eyes when I heard that they were making a Fantasy Island movie because it's like, you know, yet another TV show being mined for – uh, a movie based uh, basically solely on its name. But I have to admit that I, I'm kind of intrigued by all the elements here. And it's another one of those names that I don't I don't think it has any resonance with anybody these days. Certainly not millennials. Uh, I don't even think our generation, maybe the generation above us probably has a fondness for Fantasy Island. Um, Brad, do you have any thoughts on this one? Um, I'm intrigued by the premise and how they're changing uh, things to make it much different from what the original show was, but I'm not necessarily interested. Um, like, I don't know. It's <laughs> it's one of those things where I feel like I just need to wait to see what they do with it before I can really cast any judgment because, you know, like a lot of uh, people our age, I don't think I really have an affinity for that, uh, that series um, and, you know, not necessarily – any care for like the characters or like make like, Oh, make sure you include this element from fantasy Island or else I won't watch it. Um, <laughs> although I will say I'm, they, they, they have to figure out a way to in, include the, the, what the, the line, the, the plane, the plane. But do you think that's like uh politically correct to include that these days, Brad? I mean, well, it's not like it was politically incorrect at the time. That's how that, yeah. you know, character like, like spoke. And so like, if anything, it can be tongue in cheek, where like maybe there's a plane crash and somebody is saying "de plane, de plane." <laughs> oh God! All right, wrap it up, guys. We're done for the day. <laughs> I mean, I, I do think this is the case where you know writers and directors meet with studios, and studios bring out these big books uh, filled with IP, and they're like, you know, we don't want to make anything original, but do you have any ideas on any of this? You know, this long list of IP that we own, and I, I assume you know some screenwriter or showrunner was like. Or, or filmmaker, whatever, uh, was you know going down the list and like ah, Fantasy Island. We could, we could, we could definitely make a Westworld kind of thing out of Fantasy Island, right? <laughs> like that, that's what it seems like to me that is, is yeah. happening with these kind of things. But uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll have to keep an eye on this. I it is more intriguing than I would think. You know, I I, I didn't think I would ever have any interest in a fantasy island movie and this uh <laughs> this uh take has me uh intrigued but uh let's move on to the next story and this is uh, a remake of rookie of the year which is in the works at 20th century fox brad what do we know so rookie of the year for those of you who don't know is a movie from 1993 uh a sports comedy that followed thomas and nicholas as a kid who breaks his arm uh, out on the school playground. And when it heals, uh, it ends up his tendons and like the way the muscles and stuff, whatever, uh, his arm heals, it's tighter. And so when he throws a baseball, he throws this incredibly fast pitch. And so when he throws a, a, foul, um, a foul ball out in the outfield, or, or maybe it's, a, I think it's the opposing team's home run or something like that, um, he throws it back into into the field because you don't keep you know uh home runs from the opposing team and when he does he throws it all the way from the outfield into the catcher's mitt and so the chicago cubs uh who are their their hometown team uh decide to seek him out and turn him into their newest pitcher because this was at a time when the cubs were losing a lot <laughs> um and so it's uh it's one of those uh movies that's a favorite of kids who grew up in the 90s I know it's one that I watched over and over again when I was a kid. Uh, it's part of the reason that like I kind of became a Cubs fan along with Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Uh, even though I don't really follow baseball regularly, like I always root for the Cubs. Uh, so now it's getting remade at 20th Century Fox. Uh, they're um, having uh, Dan Greger and Doug Mand writing the movie with Greger also um, being lined up to potentially direct. 
Uh, they were behind a uh, South by Southwest comedy recently called Most Likely to Murder. And so, yeah, it's, you know, it's it's early days kind of right now. It was just announced. One of the things that is interesting is that there's the potential that this movie could turn into a title for Disney's streaming service. Because as we know, Fox is in the midst of being bought by uh, Disney and that deal is supposed to close early next year. So by the time that go- comes around, this movie could easily become one of those movies that becomes, you know, uh, an appealing um, title for the the Disney Play streaming service. Yeah, I mean, it, it it certainly seems like it would have more of a place on that streaming service than it would theatrically. And then if that does happen, Brad, they could make uh, the Rookie of the Year Angels in the Outfield cinematic universe on streaming, right? <laughs> That, I mean, honestly, like as silly as that sounds, I would be all about that because I also loved Angels in the Outfield. When I was a kid. <laughs> what uh, uh, what was with, by the way, like the the nineties and like kid movies uh, set with? I guess it's sports in general, but there was a lot of baseball movies. There's you know Rookie of the Year. There's Angels in the Outfield. There was that one where he became Little big manager, league. Little Big League. Yeah, like uh, why was there a strain? In- in general, there were just a lot more sports movies for kids back in the day. Like you had Little Giants and Mighty Ducks and The Big Green and The and Sandlot. Sandlot. Yeah, yeah, all those movies. And like kids don't really have those anymore, which is kind of a bummer. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. It's uh... it's probably because all the kids are now, uh, you know, d- doing uh, e gaming. <laughs> yeah, they're gonna start. They're gonna they're gonna start making like Fortnite movies and stuff like that. Yeah. And I think last year we wrote an article about um, something about the the creator of the Sandlot wanting to make a sequel, like another sequel, because there's already been like a, a direct. No, no, they're they're. De- I think you were gone during this. Actually, they're they're doing a, a prequel apparently. Oh really? Okay, yeah. I was just gonna say that in, in that story from last year, I remember the writer of the Sandlot talking about why. Uh, you know, kid-related sports movies uh, basically went away, and it all basically boiled down to the international box office becoming such a huge reason, oh, or, or, yeah. or you know, a, a huge uh, uh, yeah factor in making movies and getting movies greenlit these days. And because it's such a specific to America kind of thing, um, you know, foreign audiences, uh, just the the thought is that foreign audiences wouldn't care as much, or or maybe uh, yeah, wouldn't engage as much. That actually makes perfect sense. Uh, we've been talking a lot about this. Uh, you know, Apple is making a lot of uh, TV. Uh, shows for streaming and they really haven't released how they're going to release all these shows and now we kind of have an idea of how that's going to happen brad tell us about it in a bold move uh apple's actually going to re-release betamax and that's how all their shows are going to be released from now on uh so just like vinyl is getting a resurgence betamax is going to come back in a big way stock up on those players (laughs) yeah exactly it's going to be uh going to be a big deal i think um but no, in all seriousness, um, so Apple is supposed to be spending a billion dollars this year on original programming, um, but we've yet to find out when they're going to release any of it and how they're going to release any of it. But it sounds like the way they're going to do it is through uh, an app that most Apple users are already familiar with. Um, if you have an Apple TV or if you have a an iPod or an iPad, you have access to the TV app, which basically collects all of your different streaming apps uh, and services and allows you to access all of the content that is available through them through that single app. Uh, it's not perfect. It doesn't include everything, but it sounds like they're revamping the app and they're going to be releasing the original programming through that app. And not only will it be released through that app, but it will be available for free for people who have Apple devices. So if you've got an Apple TV, if you've got an iPad, if you've got an iPod, uh, you'll be able to watch Apple original shows for free through the TV app. Um, and there's there's other changes that are supposed to be coming with the TV app. The the entire extent is not known since this is information that has uh, come out unofficially and Apple hasn't confirmed or denied it. But the, the TV app will get, be getting a, an overhaul that's in the process of being worked on right now. It's supposed to um, come out some, sometime early next year. And one of the other things they'll be changing up is that the TV app will also be used to access the various subscription uh, quote-unquote channels that people have through Apple TV, such as HBO, Showtime, and Stars. Now, instead of those having their own apps on your home screen, it sounds like those will be accessed through the TV app instead. 
interesting. I, I'm kind of wondering, like, how is Apple planning on making all the money back on these TV shows? Because if they're just offering it for free to Apple users, I mean, are they going to really get enough people to switch from other devices, Microsoft, Android? Uh, I don't know. Is there anything else? <laughs> I mean... <laughs> I mean, my logically, I feel like they have all this money to spend because of how many products they're selling. So they're already making the money they need to be able to pay for those shows because it's coming from the products that people are buying. So I can't imagine that their content will be enough to convince people to be like, oh, shit, I need to get an Apple TV. Um, Even though in the grand scheme of things, Apple TVs aren't super expensive for what you get from them. Um, but you know, I think that just the amount of sheer amount of money that Apple already makes from selling all of their various devices from computers to mobile devices, I think that they have plenty of money to throw around to keep funding programming oh. for a good long while. I mean, they certainly have plenty of money to throw around. I'm just wondering, is it smart for them as a company? Like, what do they get out of it? I mean, you could ask the same thing out of netflix with all the money they spend like but, th- but people are paying to subscribe to netflix like there, yeah, there, there's and, some kind of gain there <laughs> yeah but people have to buy apple devices in order to access those things and those are infinitely more expensive than a netflix subscription yeah but you just said that no one's going to switch from you know their android device to an iphone to watch no no but, but people are going to keep buying apple devices so it's more retaining the customers yeah and, and both of you use Apple devices, right? I was, I'm pretty sure. Yes. Yeah. 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 So uh, on Apple TV, I got, I've got the Apple oven. <laughs> <laughs> um, ben, I know you notoriously, do, uh, are, you know, don't want to subscribe to any uh, new <laughs> I'm stingy, streaming that's service. That's what you're trying to say. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, now that you know Apple's going to be offering these shows for free, apparently, to Apple users, will that? I mean, will that be enough to get you to watch some of these? Yeah, if it just pops up on, like, an update to the TV app on my iPhone or something, yeah, I'll I'll be sure to check out a a few of them for sure. I think uh, I'm, I'm... I've been scratching my head ever since this news came out today, trying to figure out the same thing you were, Peter. Like, what what is their end game here? And I... I I don't know. It's like... Are they going to release the first season of these shows for free and then charge for subsequent seasons? Like try to get people hooked on the story or something? And then it yeah, has I don't know. To be it's, that. I, I yeah, I, I can't I can't wrap my mind around what the Unless what they're ad supported. Is. Unless there's like advertising, which we don't know, right? Do we know that, Brad? <laughs> We don't know whether or not there's advertising. Yeah. So uh, maybe they, maybe that's it. Maybe they're ad supporting, and uh, maybe also maybe there's integrated ads. Like maybe instead of you know product placement, there's app placement. So huh. someone is using uh, you know the Shazam app in like the new Amazing Stories TV show, and then <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to come up with why this would be beneficial to them. I don't know, <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll we'll find out soon enough because all that is uh, d- definitely uh, d- developing and is in production. Uh, let's move on to the mailbag. We have a few questions I want to get to today. Um, last week, I did mention uh, we were talking about Chronicles of Narnia and how that was kind of getting rebooted. And I I asked listeners if they actually had a nostalgia for or, or love for this series. And I'm not going to read these emails. We got a bunch of emails. Uh, I will put them in the show notes. But uh, basically, a bunch of people do. It seems like um, it's mostly from people that have been brought up with a Christian upbringing or brought up on the books. And mostly those people didn't love the movies but have a fondness for the movies. So, I mean, that answers that question. Um, Connor from Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, wrote in last week, our answer is probably too late for Connor, but I I thought it would be worth answering anyways, uh, that he's attending a 24 hour horror movie marathon in Columbus, Ohio next week. He was wondering if we have any tips, uh, from having, you know, been involved with movie marathons or going to various film festivals and, um... Yeah, so th- that is his question. Uh, I will answer this quickly. Uh, I 
have only been to a, a handful of movie marathons. I used to go to uh, Harry Knowles from Any Cool News for his birthday every December. I used to help hold, hold this uh, marathon called But Numathon, which was at the Alamo Draft House. And uh, if you were invited to go, you could uh, basically sit in a movie theater for 24 to 30 hours and watch programming that he had decided upon. It included a mix of, you know, very old movies and movies that hadn't come out notoriously. Or, I mean, and, uh, you know, I think Peter Jackson premiered some of the Lord of the Rings films there. Uh, it, it was a fun experience, but um, it, it's hard to sit in a movie theater for, you know, more than 24 hours. I, I would recommend getting comfortable clothes. Luckily, these events were at the Alamo Draft House. So literally, you just sat there and the food would be brought to you. So you don't have to, like, leave and get food and worry about snacks and uh, worry about, worrying about hydrating yourself because all that was kind of, uh, you know, right there at your disposal. Actually, I spent so much money at those events. And uh, I did mention, I think, uh, last week I did the Saw Marathon when they, I think, uh, you know, seven or eight years ago uh they they when a saw movie was coming out each year they would do these saw thons and um that was fun too but i uh for my 24-hour experience uh the biggest problem for me was the sleep because at some point you get tired and um a lot of people try to do it as an endurance test and try to make it through all of it I found that the best way of doing it is picking a movie between midnight and 4 a.m. that you choose to sleep through. <laughs> and I know that's blasphemy, but uh, you're going to this marathon to to uh, enjoy yourself. Uh, so, you know, don't uh, don't torture yourself. Uh, Brad, have you ever done any movie marathons? Uh, yes, not tons and not uh, necessarily the 24 hours, but I um, the longest one that I did was the Star Wars marathon when Force Awakens came out. Uh, I went and did the full double trilogy marathon with the for- um, ending with the Force Awakens. Uh, so that was a pretty pretty long marathon, um, right around f- 15 and a half hours. Uh, that's the longest I've spent in a movie theater in a row like that. And I definitely slept a little bit through Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith. Um, but watched the entire original trilogy again. You have to pick your battles, I think. You really do. <laughs> and then, uh, when Avengers came out, I did a marathon of the phase one of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which ended with, uh, Avengers. And then I also did um, the Lord of the Rings extended cut was released in theaters around the country for the first time uh, just before The Hobbit came out. And I've, I always wanted to see them in theaters. And so my, uh, me and my cousin Cameron and my sister, we uh, went to a theater and we watched all three of them in a row. So that was like a, that was a 12 hour affair. Have they ever done a Hobbit and Lord of the Rings extended cut trilogy, uh, you know, uh what is that marathon. called? Yeah, it's not a trilogy. It's six film, six film marathon. Is that is that something that's happened? I'm not sure if they ever did it with the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit movies, but I I think that they did it with them three those three individually. <laughs> uh, well, anyways, from your experiences that you mentioned there, what what kind of advice would you give to someone that is uh, attending a movie marathon? The comfortable clothes is definitely the the easiest thing and the best thing you can do. You're going to be sitting in that chair uh, all day long, and you don't want to be, you know, wearing just regular clothes. You need to be, be in something comfy, especially because you're going to end up sleeping at some point. Um, it, this may not be the most ethical thing to do, but sneak snacks in because most theaters don't give a shit, and you don't want to pay a lot of money for concessions all day. It's 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 best to buy a drink because you'll reuse that that cup all day. But when it comes to snacks, like don't feel bad about sneaking in some candy or some chips or something like that, because they they're they're getting money from you all day long. Uh, so just yeah, don't don't worry about it. I, I, I think that's wrong. I think that's against the rules, Brad. Uh, well, I don't play by anybody's rules. So. <laughs> ben, have you experienced any marathons? 
Uh, no, I think the longest for me was probably like a, a five or six movie day at Sundance. Um, so just a, a film festival type of experience in that that environment, um, which is, I mean, a different type of punishing because you're trying desperately to remember all the details from all these movies and write about them in between and and like afterwards. And, you know, Peter, I think you've talked about that before being like, wait, did this happen in that movie or this movie? Like, you know, after a while, a lot of that stuff tends to blend together a little bit. But um, and so you're yeah, running I've... from venue to venue sometimes with those you yeah. know, five movie days. Like the, it, most of these marathons take place, you know, in one theater and you're not leaving. So right, it's, it's right. very different. Yeah, I would just say um, put on extra deodorant because uh, <laughs> a lot of the smells uh, from from marathons and long festival days like that tend to become pretty overpowering. I mean, anything like Comic-Con, if you're in Hall H all day, it's like that kind of thing eventually just becomes uh, pretty unbearable. So I would, you know, sort of along those same lines, I would suggest to bring a backpack if the theater lets you bring a backpack in uh, these days. I don't know if that's a given anymore, but um, maybe bring like a change, a full change of clothes and like halfway through the thing, the, the marathon, just go into the bathroom and like splash some water in your face and change your clothes. And that can completely rejuvenate you uh, in, in a big way. So I would definitely recommend doing that if you're in one location for that long. Yeah, and another thing that we used to do for Button Almanthon is we'd actually bring uh, toothpaste and uh, toothbrushes because uh, if you're there for 24 hours and, you, you're, you know, you're talking to people next to you and whatever, you know, you want to have, uh, uh, you know, fresh breath. Bring some lifesavers as well, I think. Um, but anyways, let's move on. Uh, Gary from Boston writes in, uh, what are your pet peeves from watching movies or TV shows? Uh, breaking the fourth wall, parking in front of a building in New York City or Boston, and using uh, the image of a crucifix as a cheap way to signify the chosen one, or some of uh, Gary's uh, pet peeves. Uh, I'll start this off. Um, the I think the thing that bugs me the most is the misuse of tech or fake tech in films, you know, uh screens that look like they shouldn't exist on any operating system, you know, uh, technology that just isn't possible. Let's, uh, let's, uh, you know, if there's some kind of security cam footage, let's use some algorithm to clean it up. And all of a sudden, like it like goes from this blurry thing that you can't even tell what it is to like, you can read a license plate in the corner of the, the image, uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, th that's one of the things I loved about, uh, searching, uh, the movie that I think we've, <laughs> praising from uh, uh overly praising from sundance is it got most of that tech kind of stuff right um even down to like how you would you know uh reset a password and stuff and like it's, it's stuff that they probably didn't need to do i i kind of just appreciated it and i i love when when they get that kind of stuff right in movies it really does annoy me a lot uh when you know <sighs> When like uh, when it doesn't happen, and the the other thing that bugs me is when characters in a movie aren't taking their own story seriously, and uh, I th and I, I know Brad's going to disagree with me here, but I think even the best comedies, the characters in the movie are taking the situation seriously. Uh, this is one thing that bugged me about the new Ghostbusters from Paul Feig is like they didn't, uh, you know. Uh, uh, what's her name? Uh, <laughs> Melissa McCarthy? No, blonde hair. Uh, Kate McKinnon. Yeah, Kate McKinnon. Like, seemed to be, like, just doing an SNL sketch for the entire movie and not, like, even caring about, like, oh, there's ghosts, like, running around. I don't know. It, it's just, like, if you watch the original Ghostbusters, yes, they're having fun. They're uh, <laughs> goofing off and stuff. But, like, for the most part, they're taking the situation seriously. And it, it really bugs me. When, like, how are we supposed to take the story seriously if the characters in the movie aren't? Um, Brad, what are some of your pet peeves? Some of my pet peeves. Goodness. Um, I hate when the operating systems on computers and phones look nothing <laughs> like the real the real thing. Like whenever you, like they flash a an iPhone or something and like the, the messaging system looks nothing like the real iPhone messaging system or when they, you know, invent websites that look like garbage and they're, they're clearly fake, but like meant to look like another real website. Um, it's, it bugs me so much cause that's just, it's just made so that stupid people in the audience know what's going on. 
Um, I also hate when they create like fake search engines that are that look like Google or something, but it's like called yeah. like something else. It's like, why can't we just get the rights to Google? It's just. Um, I hate when characters clearly don't have liquid in cups that they're holding. There's tons of scenes th- throughout film and TV history where characters are holding mugs or Starbucks cups or something. Styrofoam is, cups are the worst. Yeah. And the way that they move when they're moving their hands, stuff like that, it's obvious there's nothing in those cups at all. Um, poorly photoshopped family photos. Holy shit. How, <laughs> how is it that we can make professional posters with amazing imagery that has been made from scratch, completely made up, but you can't take photos of yo- younger actors and make them look like legitimate family photos or high school photos or anything like that in a movie. It never fails. There is almost always some family photo that you get a, get a glimpse of or something like that where it, they clearly took several different photos from you know the real actors, whatever, and tried to make a family photo of it. There has to be a professional out there who can do this in a much better fashion. It drives me fucking crazy. <laughs> Uh, I, I know you guys create some uh, some fantastical and uh, hilarious photoshops for the post on slashfilm dot com. And some of those photos, those photoshops, that I think probably took you, you know, a matter of moments, uh, look better than some of the stuff in TV and film. Yeah, it's ludicrous. And then um, they always it, it, this has kind of become more of a tribute, I think, among uh, sound you know crew members than anything now. But they always use the exact same sounds for dolphins, baby laughs, and cats. And it kind of drives me crazy. Yeah, I think that's more of an Easter egg. Don't you think it's like kind of a fun reference? Who cares? Who, who's an Easter egg for who? People who love dolphin sounds? <laughs> I don't know. It's, uh, yeah. like, 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 like the Wilhelm scream, I get. Like That's like a funny thing. But like whenever you're making the sound where it's like supposed to be like a, a legitimate representation of something... Don't use the comical cat sound the all the time, and don't use like the the dolphin sound where it's the same you know chatter over and over again, or the, the the same goofy baby laugh. Like get go get different sounds. Yeah, there's there's one of kids, a bunch of kids laughing that has been used so many times for like the past thirty years that it's just ingrained into my head. It's like. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yes. it's got like that weird rising and falling on it. It's yeah, uh, yeah exactly. It's, yeah, Ben, what are some of your pet peeves? Uh, for me, it's it's uh, things that really the production doesn't have that much control over, but I I find myself bothered by it anyway. Um, so it, I'm not really blaming anyone here. It's sort of how movies are made, but still, like the perfectionist in me finds <laughs> finds fault with obvious continuity flaws, like anytime somebody's arm is raised in one shot and then the the angle changes and their arm is down by their side and you didn't see that happen uh it's clearly from two different takes you know that kind of thing um or someone has a glass in their hand in one shot and it's on the table yeah and and some of it is you know some of that is fine but it's it's just the more egregious uh, versions of that where i'm like all right you know most of this is sort of nobody would recognize and i'm not like actively looking for it but basically when i notice it it's like okay you probably if i'm noticing it you probably should have just reshot this this scene one more time to get this right but uh and then the other thing is the big thing and it's probably the the tiniest little thing that nobody else pays any attention to but maybe there's somebody else out there who this bothers a lot but uh, when the camera is over somebody's shoulder and they're filming a dialogue scene and two characters are talking so you're looking at somebody in the face and they're speaking and then when the person uh who you can't see is talking but you can still kind of see the side of their mouth when their mouth does not match what they're saying that really bugs me. <laughs> I don't know. It's one of those things where they're clearly using the audio from a different take, but sometimes it's so bad and you're the audience is supposed to be so invested in the story that you're watching like the reaction of the person whose face you can see for in this example. But for me, I you know, look there and then I just happen to look over and just to check to see if the person's mouth is matching what they're saying. And it almost never does because uh, it's it's most of the time they get cleaner audio and they, they use a better audio track on that person's uh, close up instead of, 
you know, the, the reverse angle of this other person's thing. So it's, it's one of those things that I, I completely understand why it happens all the time, but it's, once and, you notice and usually, it. And usually the actor that's op, uh, acting opposite the person that's like in the, I guess, medium shot, uh, usually they are giving their best performance when they are actually in their medium shot. So they're using, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So uh, it's one of those things that if you've never noticed it before, if you once you start noticing it, you'll see it everywhere. Um, and it it's one of the it just is like a a low bother. It's not uh, I'm not enraged by it, but it just is it's right there boiling onto the surface. Ben, do you think that there's a possibility that when like one of these shots happens in a movie that you like immediately your eyes dart? to the person that is not the focal point to see if this like maybe you are like you know causing your oh yeah own... i'm yeah i'm definitely exacerbating the problem because once i noticed it i check all the time now and it <laughs> never is right so yes i'm i'm definitely like digging my own hole here i fully admit that but uh but yeah that doesn't change the fact that their mouths are not matching what they're saying damn it <laughs> yes Okay, we, we have gone over our time limit, and this brings us to the end of today's show. Ben, where can people find more of your work online? You can find me writing at SlashFilm.com, and you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Ben Pears. Brad, where can people find you? SlashFilm, of course, uh, at, Ethan and, at Ethan underscore Anderton on Twitter, and also my podcast, Go Flix Yourself, on iTunes and other places where you put podcasts in your ears. Uh, you can find more of all the stories we talked about in today's podcast on SlashFilm.com. SlashFilm Daily is published every weekday on iTunes, Google Play, Overcast, Spotify, all the popular podcast apps. Uh, send us your feedback, questions, comments, concerns to Peter at SlashFilm.com. Your email can end up in the mailbag. Uh, and please, as always, go to our iTunes page. Give us a five-star review. Uh, write a review out for us, a very positive review that will help us quite a bit. Uh, tell your friends, spread the word, and we'll see you tomorrow guys i know i was joking but if they like redid mighty ducks as like a tv series for the disney streaming service how cool would it be if you had like these crossovers of kids that like are in that and rookie of the week rookie of the year and uh angels in the outfield and you could you could have this whole disney sports uh kids cinematic universe okay it's probably the more i'm saying it the words are coming out of my mouth it probably does does not sound good I'm I'm actually all all for it. <laughs> <laughs>